You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at Our Giro d'Italia. Brought to you by iWokeUp, flexible loans built for small businesses. Today, we are in Aprica. Where are we, Lionel? Well, today we are in Aprica, if we've made it this far, over three very big climbs. Wow, the Tonale is not much of a climb, Napalm. Come on. <laughs> Speak for yourself. Well, you floated over that, Lionel. Uh, the Tonale is a bear. It's a mere bump. Okay, well, the Gavia and the Mortarolo are reasonable, okay, you can, you reasonable can hills, two. I'd say. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Hillocks, mm. hillocks. And the Tonale, of course, usually I go off on a whimsical detour, whimsical tangent about witch burning on the Tonale, but I'm not going to do it this year. Aprica was where the stage finished the, the day... The Giro was in mourning after Marco Pantani was expelled from the 99 race, wasn't it? It was where um, Roberto Heras won the stage and uh, Ivan Gotti got the pink jersey. Yeah, very, very famous spot in Giro history, um, primarily because stages very often finish there after the ascent of the Mortirolo. So a lot of, a lot of memorable episodes in Giro history have taken place in or close to Aprica. Well, what's coming up in today's episode? We're going to hear again from Andy Hampston. Uh, it's all about the Gavia in 1988, uh, a very, very famous stage. And we'll hear from Andy Hampston exactly what it was like to, um, to to ride that day in the snow and to end up winning the 1988 Giro. Still the only American ever to win the Giro. Um, and, uh, well, it's a, it's a great story, and Andy Hampson tells it extremely well. It's part two of our Andy Hampson episodes. Um, but before we get into Andy Hampson's story, um, can you give us the tale of the tapa, please, Lionel? I can, Richard. Yeah, this is from Mezzo Lombardo to Aprica, 191.9 kilometres on Daniele Fribrancini's uh, route, uh, the, the pimple of the Tonale. Can I intervene with a, yep. with another whimsical... Um, Superficial, oh, <laughs> me, trivial detail. Um, there's been beef in Italy over the last few months about the appellation um, Alto Adige. So this region, the regions are north of Trento, Bolzano, has in the past been referred to as Alto Adige and Sutiro in in German. Alto Adige has now been banned as a as a denomination, and it's now to be called the Autonomous Province of Bolzano, and this has caused a big hoo ha in Italy. So that's where we're starting the the Autonomous Province of Bolzano. Carry on, Napalm. I thought you were going to say they brought in some kind of ridiculous rule, like you're you're only allowed to climb the Gavia by bicycle before 11am or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> that will be next, won't it? That'll be That'll next. Be next. <laughs> yeah. yep. Anyway, the Gavia, which features heavily in our episode today, is right smack bang in the middle of the stage. But the bit that we'll be riding on the RGT cycling platform, Richard, the Mortirolo, is uh, at the finish. It looks, from the profile, pretty steep in places. Angry red segments showing that the gradient is in excess of about 10, 12, 15 percent. Um, for quite considerable, at least chunks. we don't have snow, Lionel. At least we don't have snow. We don't have snow. I mean, I'm, I'm. I don't. I don't. I don't think smart trainers do that yet, do they? <laughs> they do. They can go off your cobbles, but, but but not snow. Some kind of shower attachment going over the top will be next, won't it? So that you can replicate yeah. bad weather <laughs> indoors. Uh, it's got. To, it's got to be coming. <laughs> yeah. But um, well, I'm already regretting the fact that we've got challenge Mallorca rules on our Giro, which means that you can abandon a stage and Ch- Chingiali of Watford taking part in <laughs> this stage today. I will be taking part. I'll give the Mortirolo a try and see how far up it I can get in an hour. Let's hear how we're getting on. Just before we do, Napalm, um, I I did include a nice, a lovely false flat at the top of the Mortirolo because we're not going down the traditional way. Um, We're going via a sort of another summit or another mountain um, known locally as Monte Padrio, which hopefully will be featured in the Giro one day coming up from the other side because it's a fantastic climb but if anyone is does climb the Mortirolo it's a very famous um, it's a popular destination for amateur cyclists just take that right turn at the summit and um, there's 
to Monte Padrio and there's some fantastic roads, tiny, um, very quiet roads up on that plateau. Generally, you can, you can have a great time up there, just, you know, zigzagging around on the top of the Frolicking. Monterolo. <laughs> Oh, thank you very much. Running through the wheat fields. Thank you very much for your mercy, sir. Thank you for showing us mercy with a false <laughs> flat. I really appreciate well, it. Well, a good a good omen today, though, Lionel, is that Andy Hampson's bike tour company in Tuscany is called Chingali after wild boar. Um, mm. So, if you, you know, if you're looking for signs that this might be your day, mm. that could be it. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, let's go over to the course and see which of us is suffering on the climb. Okay, I'm still a couple of days behind, but here I am, back in the sweat box, back on the turbo trainer. And the the absurdity of this struck me, actually, as I looked ahead to today's episode, in which we look back with Andy Hampston at his Giro win in 1988, which he basically won on the Gavia, in the snow-covered Gavia, freezing cold, wrapped up in ski gear, just... Uh, battle for survival that day and uh, well what madness is this here I am sun is shining and I'm sitting indoors sweating uh, anyway <sighs> I thought while I was here I would remind you that Stacy Snyder's cycling podcast mugs and cappuccino sets the f- second and final batch go on sale on Wednesday that's tomorrow uh, at 12:30 p.m. US East Coast time, 5:30 p.m. UK British Summer time, 6:30 Central European time. Go to etsy.com forward slash shop forward slash Snyder Ceramics. Details or link in the show notes. Good luck, and remember that the proceeds from the cups and mugs go to the Squala Ciclismo Cheni near Bergamo. So um, good luck if you're going to try and get one. And well, I'll carry on. I'm on a on a descent. Actually, how unusual! And finally, as I finish today's stage, or a couple of days ago stage, uh, we have been shortlisted once again, a fourth year in a row, in the British Podcast Awards in the Best Sports Podcast category. We're absolutely delighted about that. You can also vote for us in the Listener's Choice uh, Award. Go to BritishPodcastAwards.com forward slash vote and search for the cycling podcast. That's BritishPodcastAwards.com forward slash vote. And thanks, British Podcast Awards, for shortlisting us again. Thank you. You are listening to the Cycling Podcast at Our Giro d'Italia. Brought to you by Iwoka. Flexible loans built for small businesses. IWOCA.co.uk Thank you very much indeed to our title sponsor, Iwaka. Um, very grateful to them for their support, enabling us to be here covering our Giro. And we've been talking the last few days about significant news that Iwaka got last year that they've been accredited by the British Business Bank to uh, to offer Sybils the uh, loans available to small businesses to help them deal with the coronavirus crisis. Go to iwaka.co.uk for more information. There's lots of information there. <laughs> Amarcord, I remember. Verona e l'arena, c'è anche Romeo e Giulietta. Arriva il giro d'Italia, van tutti in bicicletta. E la cronometro a squadre, che meraviglia! Sembra che i corridori ballano la quadriglia. No, sai che? Sai sì, che? Sì, sì, sì. Insomma, questa è venuta, l'ho fatta io in una notte. Questa <ride> Capolavoro. Andate sul giro d'Italia. Sì. Vieni al, gi- vieni al giro, se sei felice o sei nei guai. Vieni al giro, se tu riposi oppur non dormi mai. La maglia rosa, nessuno sa se poi la indosserà. Solo a Milano c'è chi la veste e chi la sognerà. C'è qualcosa qui nell'aria, sai, 
di corsa vai Fernando è un corridore che tutto pepe core indovina un po' tu è un fatto strano è proprio un italiano e di no tante gu Maurice, that was our fantastic evening uh, in the company of the Giro's uh, troubadour in residence, Dino Zandegu, uh, winner of the 1967 Tour of Flanders, if I'm not mistaken. And um, we were actually, well, we were pretty much where we would be um, after a stay to Aprica because um, that night the stage, it was the, the infamous stage that I don't like talking about involving um, Tom Dumoulin, was it not? Stage finished at Bormio. Um, after the descent of the Stelvio and we drove down the valley and we stayed at a fantastic little inn called the Alta Villa Locanda in Bianzone. Um, Dino Zandegu was also there and he serenaded us after dinner with songs about Verona, Fernando well, Gaviria, Dino yeah. Zandegu himself. Mor- Maurizio Fondrius was there as well. I remember we arrived very late, didn't we? And we were we were holding our breath, hoping that they would still serve us food and they served us that delicious a feast. wholemeal pasta with the cheesy sauce absolutely delicious and it was a it was a really cozy little place wasn't it we were up in the mountains it was quite cool outside and there's this cozy little hacienda perched on top of the mountains really popular place obviously because i remember there were there were just cars kind of massed all around and yet it was in the middle of nowhere and it was my introduction to dino zandegu um and his incredible uh a range of songs on his re- in his repertoire. Famously, after winning that um, 1967 Tour of Flanders, it, well, it all started his sort of singing career, more more a singing career than a cycling career. It all started after that 1967 Tour of Flanders when I think on live on uh, Rai, the state Italian television, he sung um, "O Sole Mio." Interesting. Well, Zandegu was also a team manager of the Malvor team at the end of the 80s and the early 90s. And Malvor's classic green and red hooped jersey, quite narrow um, horizontal striped jersey, is in Group D in the Coppa Italia of cycling jerseys. Got some tough competition in there. Salvarani, um, Domina Vacanzi's uh, Palm Tree Effort and Vincenzo Nibali's Astana National Championships jersey, which really ought to uh, finish bottom of the group and be consigned to the dustbin for not showing enough respect to the Tricolore. But uh, there's still time to vote, I think, in Group D of the Coppa Italia on Twitter at cycling underscore podcast. We're going to crown the greatest ever Italian cycling jersey before we reach Milan on Sunday. Um, Please, please vote against Mapai wherever you have the opportunity. Uh, uh, <laughs> as someone who's colour blind and struggles <laughs> yeah. red and green, I, I never knew they were red and green hoops. I just thought it was some kind of reddy green kind of concoction. It's just a sort of it's just brown, I expect to you, is it? Just a single <laughs> shade of brown. What, what what's brown, Lionel? <laughs> what, one one of our colleagues, the Italian journalist Filippo Kautz, who we're gonna have on the podcast in a couple of days, um he told me a great story about Going to the 1991 Giro in which, uh, the last stage of the 1991 Giro in which Max Lely had won the white jersey, Filippo just wore a white, plain white t-shirt and took a, a marker pen and um, he, he he drew on uh, the, what, what, who's Max Lely's sponsor? Was it Del Tongo that year? Um, he drew on the logo anyway and that was the white jersey. It was as a Del Tongo jersey featured in the... Copa it Italian. is indeed, yeah, the classic blue and yellow Del Tongo. Which group is that in? Can I tell you? I don't think I can. Uh, oh, it groups. Uh, I group like C. I, I like that one. Group C, mm. that's in. Yeah, it's a good one. Max Lely was riding for Ariostea. Oh, that's also in there. The yellow and red sort of uh, roof tile effect. Um, always one of my favourites, that, because uh, red and yellow are Watford colours. Um, I used to make my own cycling jerseys out of out of plain T-shirts when I was a child. Um, you've probably heard of the, the famous Tour de Kings Langley that Simon Gill and I rode, um, the, well, the infamous sex shop time trial. There was a leader's jersey, which, which I decorated using uh, fabric pens that then, uh, well, unfortunately, the, all of the logo ran as uh, you know basically sort of a combination of rain and sweat meant that they uh, they all ran but that was the technology we had in the 80s unfortunately 
Anyway, Dino Zandigu, Daniel, what else was he famous for? Um, well, I, I don't like to suggest that Dino liked to drink, um, but well, I I became quite well acquainted with Dino a few years ago when I was researching my book on Eddie Merckx, and you know, I, I remarked on how great Dino's stories were, and he used to uh, he said to me that if I called him up at well, if I, if I called him up at midday, they were good, and if I called him up at three o'clock in the afternoon they'd be exceedingly good um suggesting that you know between those hours he liked to uncork a bottle or two i think he he was also um famous for um well wine bottles flying out of the window when he was behind the wheel of a team car um on 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 more than one occasion i think don't do that at home kids i mean they were different days weren't they different days vino del giorno chin chin The Cycling Podcast now winds its way through the slopes of the Alto Adige, where the first wine in the full Giro is the Foradori Tereldigo, which is made in Trentino from a biodynamic vineyard run by Elizabeth the Foradori, who took over operation as a 19-year-old some 35 years ago. Now, Tereldigo is quite a rare grape variety that really shows off its mountain heritage. Some wild flowers and wild herbs, with some cooler climate berries, things like juniper, some things that are slightly more astringent. And that's why the 20 months in large oak barrels then mellows out some of that flavor and some of that acidity to make a fabulous food wine. So the Baby Giro focuses on the Nicholas Lagrine, which Lagrine is also synonymous with the Alto Adige. It's a cooler climate grape that generally shows off some of those similar flavours in Tereldigo. You know, those, that darker profile, that more leaner aspect that gives you a fresher wine that really sits well at the dinner table. This one as well has been aged for 18 months in oak, large oak barrels and both wines would benefit from 15 to 20 minutes open before, the, before sitting down to drink. Now, In terms of food matching, both of these I think would go really well with things like smoked duck, venison, and even veal. Really fabulous ones to enjoy at the dinner table. So, chaps, this um, this is a wine from well, clearly the 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 Daniel Freib of um, of winemaking in Trentino, Elisabetta Fodadori. She was 19 when she started making this. Wonderful, Teroldego. Prodigy. Mm. Very much like myself. <laughs> Very much like yourself. <laughs> Do winemakers get yeah. a white jersey? Best young white. Best well, young wine nineteen. Uh, yeah, I, well, I've <laughs> never heard of um, someone nineteen um, making such a prestigious wine. But what do you what do you think? Reg, um, quite dark, and the robe is quite. It's quite sort of purpley. Um, but and quite surprising on the nose, a bit of sort of pomegranates, cranberries, um, a bit of mountain spice there, as um, as our friend Greg from Divine Cellars was saying. Mm. I'm getting a bit of red wine on the nose there, oh, uh, Daniel. Oh god! And red wine on the palate as well. Excellent. Yes. No, it's it, Excellent. It, it's it's very uh, it's very smooth, smooth, very velvety. Biodynamic, yet again. Um, we've, we've. I'm not going to go in. I really did want to, um, did want to spend a few minutes discussing, you know, biodynamic winemaking and the rhythms yeah. of the sun and the moon with you and how you know, this this affects viticulture. But we won't do that. We won't do that. Well, save that for the wine podcast, maybe, um, where you probably have a huge cycling segment because you're that <laughs> contrary. <laughs> there'd be more. There'd be more cycling in the wine Daniel yeah. Freed's wine podcast. Yeah. Uh, Daniel's self indulgent indulgent cycling segment of the wine podcast, <laughs> <laughs> talking about the the 1963 tour of the Mediterranean. <laughs> shall Shall we? Um, shall we go back to a fine? Vintage Giro, um, a fine vintage of the Giro, the 1988 race. Um, the the year before, of course, had been won by the Irishman Stephen Roach, and uh, Andy Hampson went into the race as one of the favourites, but an outsider, certainly. And um, between 85 and 88, he had moved on to the Lavi Claire team, the kind of all powerful Lavi Claire team. He was part of the 1986 um, Tour de France winning team uh, when Greg LeMond went head to head with his teammate Bernard Eno he was a, a very important uh, uh, rider in that race for Lavi Claire but 
He then moved back to 7-Eleven for the opportunity to lead that team. Uh, he was he was in Le Mans shadow at La Vie Claire. The irony, uh, the bitter irony, being that, of course, uh, Le Mans missed the 87 race when he was accidentally shot by his brother-in-law. And, and uh, you know, perhaps Hampson would have got a greater opportunity had he stayed at La Vie Claire. We'll never know. But he went back to 7-Eleven and led the American team as it continued to develop um, and uh, strengthen. Uh, and uh, he went into the 88 Giro as an outside favourite. 88 Giro, Rich, um, it was starting on 23rd of May. When do you think Vincenzo Torriani, the race director, unveiled the route? What would you the following what would your day? Well, be? <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, it was a very mountainous route, wasn't it? Just sent them to do a prologue round Urbino while he just finished up the maps. Well, it was it was in the first week of March, fifth um, of March. He unveiled the route for a, a race that was beginning six weeks later, um, six seven weeks later. That would that would be gr- that would be fantastic um, if they could do that now, wouldn't it? Can you imagine the Twitter storm if that was the case? You know, it's un- totally unfair. The riders don't know what they're going to be doing. Well, I remember Moser had retired, hadn't he, by then? And so they were they were searching out the mountains more than they had done earlier in the eighties. And it was it was yeah, Italy suddenly became a very flat country when Francesco Moser was at his peak. Yeah, yeah, in the Moser years. Yeah, so th- this was one that suited the climbers, riders like Andy Hamston. Well, Daniel, going into this 88 Giro, it was, there was a bit of a power vacuum in Italian stage racing, wasn't there? Because uh, Roberto Vicentini, the winner two years previously, he had kind of been cracked by Stephen Roach. Moser, as you say, had retired. Um, Giuseppe Cerrone was, uh, was still riding but was over the hill. And I suppose when you look at the GC, uh, n- names that... I mean, Franco Coccioli won the Giro in 91. He finished fifth. Marco Giovanetti won the Vuelta. He finished sixth. There was Flavio Giponi, who finished fourth. But, I mean, that was uh, there wasn't really a, a, an obvious Italian uh, successor to Moser and Soroni at this point, was there? No, there wasn't Napalm. And it was a bit of an anomaly, really. Um, difficult to put your finger on why um, there the weren't better stage races at that time. I mean, I think the, the Dutch teams in particular were really developing at this point and um, the the Italians were in their shadow when they did race internationally but they, they didn't do a lot of racing abroad I mean Moser had had an unbelievable career as we mentioned yesterday won 240 races he did the Tour de France once um, in that Tour de France he finished seventh and he also won the white jersey and he never went back and Beppe Saroni was a very precocious rider who um, was brilliant at the start of his career and won the Giro and um, faded very quickly but he also only rode the, the Tour de France once at the end of his career so there was there was a real vacuum they of course had um, Argentine who was emerging and some other fantastic one day racers but yeah, the, the cupboard was pretty bare as far as stage, ra- stage racing was concerned. I think 75 was the first year the white jersey was awarded to the best young rider in the Tour de France. And I think in 87, Cerrone was r- still riding for the Del Tongo team and they were invited to the Tour de France largely because the race was starting in West Berlin. It was a way to invite two Polish riders, Czeslaw Lang and Lech Piasecki, who uh, ended up with uh, the yellow jersey for a day or so in that Tour de France. And Soroni was kind of the... Um, well, he was he was the, the team leader, the star. His debut at the Tour de France coming at the age of... 29. I mean, that's that's quite unusual these days. You wouldn't be that successful in the in the Giro and elsewhere and, and not make your debut at the Tour de France until right at the tail end of your career. I mean, that, again, just shows what the era was like. Well, we heard in last night's episode about Andy Hampson's debut at the Giro d'Italia, his first Grand Tour in 1985, where he won a stage. He didn't go back until 1988 um, when he went in, leading the 7-Eleven team. And as a, a genuine outside bet for the pink jersey. We hadn't been to the Giro for 86 and 87. And I was on La Vie Claire in 86, um, rejoined 7 Eleven in 87 as the leader, but we focused on the Tour of Switzerland and the Dauphine Libre during that time period but we had Hoonved as a co-sponsor but I think it was just a lot of excitement within the team 
you know, I think I'm sure I can speak for everyone. We loved racing in Italy, and the Giro was historically a very important race to us. The Tour is a bigger race, and it, it's the only one that was on American TV, so it, it, it's what we had to focus on for our sponsor. But it was a bit of a homecoming for us to do the Giro. Probably three years later, coming back to Italy, we were thinking, oh, great, we're not Neo Pros. They're not going to pick us on us anymore. And they really respect our team. I was very excited, and we had a very keen team to come back to the Giro in 88. Of the rivals, you know, of the other riders um, you were you were facing there, who, who, who stood out for you? Who was the danger? Well, for me, it was Broikink. Because we, we seemed to always race together, and that spring... He won the Tour of the Basque Country by winning solo, the short mountainous or hilly stage in the morning, and then the time trial in the afternoon, which certainly gave him the overall victory. Um, he was a rider I really watched. Er Zimmerman was very strong in those years. Um, certainly Vizentini. There was a lot of young riders. I mean, Fondriest was around, Johnny mm. Bugno. Tony um, Rominger was a stage winner there. Tony well. Rominger yeah. was coming into his very peak form. Jean Francois Bernard as well. Yeah, mm. Bernard was there. But also, we knew that Italians, we'd raced in Italy quite a bit. We knew the politics very well because we had Mike Neal as a director, and we knew they, they loved talking to the press. And they love, you know, they would never say they're going to win because they're always trying to be sly. And, and hide their hand when they're feeling strong. But we also knew their rivalries would trip them up, even though there was a lot of talk about from Italians saying, well, we'll make sure an Italian rider wins this year because a foreigner won last year with Stephen Roche. And, I mean, stage uh, 12, wasn't it, that you won? Nice little story uh, into Salvino. Nice story there about your... There's a, a picture of you winning that stage with your your Oakley Pilots. I mean, not they, they weren't very weren't very common in those days. Those uh, you know cycling cycling sunglasses, but you were you were on a bonus for wearing them in the in the photograph, I believe. Yes, so that that was that was a fun stage. It was it finished near Bergamo. The Salvino was a famous climb. Um, a, a lot of turns. You know, very nice stadium to race up for the fans to watch. And we did a couple of pretty hard climbs before that. And it was a stage I was that I thought, looking on paper, this will be great. There's two hard climbs beforehand to get everyone softened up, and then I'll try attacking near the end. DJ Anstin, ormai a 100 metri al traguardo. Ecco il presidente di giuria, Amstin, che già aveva vinto una tappa due anni fa al suo esordio tra i dilettanti. Vince la tappa, Amstin. It was a great moment because I just, I felt so good. I had so much energy. I didn't even notice the two climbs coming into it. Pretty sure they were climbs. But the two things that, that I remember now is attacking and feeling so good and so excited that I no one went with me. And I think it was three kilometers to go. Like it really was time for anyone who had the legs to make a move. And realizing that Zimmerman and Roy King, all these climbers I was worried about, like I was really, really having a great day. And also breaking a tradition that I had finally disciplined myself to learn in that you never take a bottle from anyone else because it might be tainted. Mm -hmm. But that day I was staying at the front on the earlier climbs. A rider that I thought we were, I was friends with from our amateur times together, so my age, Alessandro, someone, was on the Carrera team, and he was racing through his, I was, there were so many of his fans, I figured, or I knew he was from the area, and he kept getting bottles handed up to him. Mm. <laughs> so he kept like throwing them away, and I was out of water, and it was the last hour of racing, and I didn't want to you know, bother my team. So I just asked him if I could have a sip out of one of the bottles from a fellow that looked like it might be his dad. And he handed me the whole bottle and said, oh, keep it, which I thought was very, very rare. Mm. Italians don't help foreigners. And then I realized, no, these are, you know, there's a lot of respect amongst 
ourselves. And I trusted him that the bottle wouldn't be tainted and kept it and used it mm. to win the stage. And get and, and pocket the bonus. And pocket which, oh, which, so the which bonus, helped so you buy a, buy a house, I believe. Well, <laughs> it was probably a thousand dollars, but it was um, that was money yeah, to yeah. me back yeah, yeah. in those days. Yeah. And it was it was funny because you know I put the, the, the there were those big eye shades and on a climb I you know liked wiping the sweat out of my eyes so I didn't usually wear them, but the the last kilometer had a flat bit to it and I remember pedaling as hard as I could being all alone but trying to get time for general classification trying to get as much time as I could thinking oh my gosh I don't have my glasses on I'll lose a little time but I thought no it's all right just do it quickly and I put them on pretty quickly and it mm. must have been on television and it was noted and it was included it was noted by Francesco Moser was hired to have a little blurb every day as a journalist I think he was trying to follow the Italian slight Italian model of disparaging all things foreign but he was so impressed by the fact that this American obviously he threw away his couple of seconds he did it quickly but he threw away some time to put his glasses on because he'll be paid money you know that's yeah. a house or whatever so, <laughs> didn't know how little money it was but he is so confident no european would have done that <laughs> but this american for the money was so confident in his abilities that he remembered his little bonus program which i thought was an offhand compliment yeah i guess that sort of professionalism as well might have impressed them and and the presence of mind in a moment like that to remember i guess that would have uh, been indication of the sort of the sort of form you were in Jira was heating up nicely for you. I mean, heating up is the wrong phrase, of course, because two days later we've got the the famous stage. The stage. I mean, how many times have you been have you been asked about the, the Gavi and stage fourteen of that Giro? How many? I mean, um, if you're on a bonus for that, you know, you'd be <laughs> no many. But it's that was the day. The Gavia day was the one I was really looking forward to. Um, going into the whole Giro in '88, I was. I was hunting. I had bronchitis, which I usually did most springs, um, preparing for the Giro. But I ended up fourth at the Tour of Romandy, you know, feeling I was recuperating. And I thought, well, this is great. Uh, you know, the Giro is a fantastic race. I'd loved, I'm going to race it to win it. If it doesn't work, the team agreed with me where we came up with the idea together. It would be better to lose 10 or 20 minutes. And then I could go and try to win stages. So winning on the Salvino was fantastic. It proved I was on very good form. We're in the deep into the second week. I was able to relax on the easier days and stay out of trouble coming up to that. But looking at all the stages in the, the race book, the one that even more than the Stelvio, the, the stage that looked the most dangerous or the most dangerous for everyone, but most advantageous for someone having a good day was the Gavia in De Bormio because it was probably the hardest climb um, and one that would be good to my abilities because it was steeper than the Stelvio. The road was dirt and I liked riding on dirt roads, but I hadn't raced on a dirt road, professionals. Um, but it, it was sometimes shorter stages present larger opportunities than long multi-mountain stages. So it was one my team had been focusing on. And actually, I had a very nice conversation with Johnny Mota, who won the Giro in 66 mm -hmm. and was a very big friend towards sort of any American cyclist because he loved selling bikes in, in America. Um, and I had met him in Bergamo years earlier when I was there as an amateur. And he came to me on the, I think it's either the prologue day or the day before that when we have all the hoopla with the press, with the presentation. Mm. And he said, hey, Andy, you, you've got to, you know, you can win this Giro and you've got to do it on the Gavia. And I said, oh, thanks, Johnny. That's super nice. Ah, he said, he was really serious. He said, cut the bullshit. When I talk to Italians about how hard the Giro is, 
the riders call me an old man. Even my colleagues that I raced with, with who are the directors now, keep saying the same nonsense. And that that is, oh, the bikes, they're so, these modern bikes, they're so light and they have so many gears now. The mountain doesn't really matter. You know, it's the riders that decide how hard a mountain is. You know, these old fashioned mountains aren't going to make any difference like they would have back in the 60s. He said, this mountain's a monster. You have to focus on it. Because it, it hadn't appeared in the Giro for, for a couple of decades, had it? From three Three decades, it had yeah. been in, I think, 60 and 61, or 61, 62. Mm. And it was a monster back then. The road was a little bit worse. And, you know, flat tires were the challenge then. So Italians were saying, oh, we'll, we'll just treat it like Perry roubaix We'll have mechanics with extra wheels for the flats on this dirt. But it was, it was a very, very good dirt road. It wasn't a bad surface at all, which ends up since it snowed being key because it wasn't slippery it wasn't icy because the road crew had cleared the roads weeks ahead of when they would have on a regular schedule so the sun had warmed the surface there was enough warmth in the roadbed that when the snowstorm came and snowed on it in the and the plows cleared it. It wasn't an icy layer. It wasn't frozen at the base. It was mm. just slushy snow on a dirt road that had pretty good adhesion. You know, again, waking up in the morning, having targeted that stage and seeing the weather, was that something that you you relished, or or, or did you fear for the the stage itself? Um, I feared it because you know I'd won two days before going into Salvino, but that morning we woke up. I think our village was at seven or eight hundred meters and it was snowing out you know we knew that bad weather was coming but uh, that was we didn't expect snow and there was a special meeting between the the teams and the in the race who were in contact with the road crew who reported no oh, we'll have you know we'll pass the plow we'll keep plowing the road will be passable um the race was on the start was delayed and we eliminated the descent we would have started with but we did the tonale climb we started you know on the schedule but later than what we would have by 20 minute descent and it was sleeting dumping rain the whole stage i mean we were soaked to the bone the first five minutes i was wearing all the warm and rain protection clothes i possibly could have and the tonale been on it quite a few times mostly driving with my tour groups to get near the area it's a pretty tricky climb i would say it's a category two climb it's fairly hard and has a fairly tricky descent even though there aren't many switchbacks and i remember on the climb no one was going terribly fast on it we were all worried and chatting and shivering and worried about what was coming and on the descent of the climb which is pretty fast because there aren't switchbacks but a lot of blind turns. I remember shaking so hard on my bike that I'd loosened my grip on my bars because I couldn't steer very well. And I just had to lean the bike. And then there's a false flat climb up to Ponte de Leño, which, I don't know, let's call it 10 kilometers of easy climbing. And I was hoping to warm up during that period, and I didn't. <laughs> I was starting to hunker down and think maybe I should just keep all my clothes on and just try to stay warm and survive but I, I did what bike racers are taught to do and look at my up looked at my opposition and saw everyone was was scared um Chile was petrified he was white as a sheet you know he had the leader's jersey he had everything to lose no one <laughs> no one was joking and having a good time um my team kept coming up to me with hot sweet tea and water bottles every five minutes they were drowning me in tea but also they were saying hey andy you know, neil <laughs> neil and max tester in the car they're dying to know you know they keep asking me how you're looking and, and, and max, please give max, me something new to say and max tester and I, knew the climb very well didn't he because he had a, he, he knew the yeah. climb very well which which really helped mm. because none of us you know went before the climb, before the race, and scouted things out like as we might have done today. He lived in Lombardy. He'd been over it many times. So he, he told us from Ponte de Legno, it would be, oh, I think, six or eight kilometers of a wide road, 6% grade, 
very regular road and then there'll be a few switch curves hard curves not quite switchbacks and then a left hand switchback and the road with i think it's 12 kilometers from the top he told us the road will turn to dirt it'll go down to one lane through a, a large a stand of large pine trees so so we would see that coming you know and also we'd know the kilometers um coming and then he'd, he'd told us you know one lane regular grade but often very steep and on the downhill there's no rhyme or reason to the whole thing like he couldn't you know it's not that you do six switchbacks and then have a long stretch where it'd be very fast and then more switchbacks it was and i been on my bike i've been over the gavia dozens of times since then and i still couldn't really describe it to someone you know if, if they were going to try to do that descent very fast there's it seems that there's four right turns in a row and then a left turn mm. um it, it doesn't it's it's a paved goat track is how it was described to me so going you know in that valley i just i remember having a conversation with bob roll and we were both scared but we were both very excited about the opportunity and our team meeting had been about <laughs> preparing ourselves to survive the best we can and that's also the best tactic for andy to go ahead with you know what had been the the key point of the whole race is this is where you know, we really wanted to attack and get me in the lead or, you know, see what we could, what would happen. And we knew the storm would be coming from direct and racing into, from the, you know, we're racing north to send 25 kilometers into Bormio from the top. So we knew the weather would deteriorate. The descent would be worse than the climb and it was going to be brutal all day long. But the team went to all the ski shops. We had a little ski area and bought all the warm gloves and wool hats and little warm clothing items we could find and each rider prepared a musette bag with those clothes in it but instead of a feed Demokowitz the manager would be one kilometer from the top with this musette bag of warm clothes and a soigneur would have hot tea a few kilometers from the top for everyone so we didn't have to rely on the two cars for for all of our riders so this wasn't for me as much because if i was racing well i would have our lead car behind me with with my warm clothes in it but it would make a big difference for all the riders on the team they would you know have that little security blanket of warm clothes at the top <laughs> we had the swanniers put lanolin mm. on our bodies not just our legs but our torsos our arms back we tried to waterproof our bodies as much as we could with lanolin and that was something the riders really didn't like because it's terribly hard to get off in the shower some of us would put it on our legs in Belgian classics when it would be really cold. But it, it was, Mike Neal convinced us it's what channel swimmers use to keep warm in water and that we would be wet all day long. So going into this, you know, before Ponte de Leño, we were going uphill. A breakaway had gone, so Del Tongo was doing tempo at the front, not very convincingly. But that that was that was good. There was Johan Vandeveld was in the breakaway, mm. who was a worry. But you know there was no one I was really worried about, and it wasn't up to me to put my team to the front. But during this period, without being warm, but drinking a lot of hot tea, I just you know finally clicked. And I'm not going to say I, I got brave, but I relaxed and I took off my rain jacket. I took my booties, leg warmers, arm warmers. You know, two soaking wet, mm. not very warm layers. You know, I took 20 pounds of sodden clothing off of me and sent it back to my <laughs> to my manager, wondering how I was doing. And just had a conversation with Bob about, wow, today is, you know, we've really got to be ready. And he responded, yeah, you know, today it's it's the Gabia, it's going to be great. And you know, he he was trying to psych me up, I guess. I no, 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 you be ready. You know, I'll I'll do what I can. If it goes well, I'll I'll do well. But it's going to be 
so bad on that mm. descent. And that was our also our tactic that mm. instead of me attacking on the climb and fighting for every second, trying to hold it, descending to the finish, I was going to go 95, I would attack, but at 95% on the climb and hold enough energy that I could think clearly on the descent with the knowledge that giving up some seconds, maybe by slowing down and maybe going some seconds or minutes slower on the uphill could pay me back in minutes on the downhill mm. just because of the weather. And I, I think that that was a pretty accurate yeah. assumption. So I had my team go to the front after Ponte de Leno and do pretty hard tempo, but you know not not really too fast going into the base of the Gavia. And then when we hit the hard, with 12 Ks to go, when it, when it got to 14% and turned to dirt, I thought, well, <laughs> that's a long way to go. Here I am at the front. I won two days ago. Everyone's looking at me. Boy, what do I do? And the only thing I could think of was just to attack hard right away. And I thought, I'll do three hard attacks. That should settle it into a group. And then I'll, you know, worry about catching the breakaway and see what I can do for tempo. But my first attack got me away clean. And there, there was a switchback right after that. So I could look down and very accurately assess where people were. And everyone was strung out. It was too steep for me to worry about anyone working together to catch me. Everyone who wanted to be was at the front. It wasn't a surprise move. But I could see Kyochali, Zimmerman, Broy King all the regular climbers, the GC guys, struggling as as much as I was. So I thought, well, <laughs> darn, it worked. So I, I, I went hard. I didn't, I tried not to get too excited and go too hard up the climb, but I was very cold. I knew, you know, if I keep eating and drinking a lot for the calories, it would help. Um, I knew the faster I went, the more heat I would produce. I was tampering down my enthusiasm a little bit, even though no one caught me. I knew from the chalkboard that I was holding Zimmerman and Broikink and I think Giappone were doing quite well in keeping me you know, a minute to two minutes, but they weren't together. So I, I thought, well, that, that's good. I, you know, if I go over the top with that, they, they might surge and catch me, but you know, I, I can deal with that little group, but I'll keep the pressure on. I got a lot of tea. There, there, there's a certain point where the, the road went through a cutout that's infamous because um, um, there was a tragedy with a truckload of s soldiers went off the road back in the 50s. So mm. all of Italy knew about this road. And at that point, I picked up some hot tea from Etienne, my one of my soigneurs, and I have photos from that point. And it was about them that I thought, okay, I'm in the clothing I had was regular shorts, shoes, socks, no shoe covers. But I had a long sleeve undershirt over a wool jersey. I was leading the combination blue jersey and it was nice to have a wool jersey and it had a short zipper on it and I thought, well, you know, I'll <laughs> I better zip up to keep warm. So I zipped up that three <laughs> inch zipper and I called my team car up and I'll, I'll put on a wool cap and I'll put a neck warmer on, you know, take some fidgeting to get this on. And But the road was not so steep that I thought it'd be a good time to do it. So I put the neck warmer past my face with big Oakley <laughs> mm. factory pilots on, was tricky. Mm. And then, you know, the wool cap that I'll really pull down tight and I'll pull up the, the neck warmer over my nose and ears for the descent. And when I went to to dry my to dry my hair, I thought before I put on the wool cap. That reminds me, I, I had neoprene gloves on that that divers, scuba divers use, mm. because I knew if my fingers didn't work, I wouldn't be able to to break or put clothing on at the top. So I never took my my good gloves off. But when I went to dry my hair, uh, <laughs> I ended up knocking a snowball. <laughs> um, the snow was mounting up on my head, and it, I felt it roll down my back, and I had no idea. I thought, I'm not even melting the snow that's that's falling on me, which means it's cold. You know, it was it was snowing quite hard. It wasn't blowing hard. It wasn't a blizzard, but it was a cold, wet snowstorm and getting colder the further up we were going. And all the time you're thinking of self-preservation for the descent, really, aren't you? I mean, 
that that was that would have been the the thing foremost in your mind, I guess. Yes. So I was exactly. I was trying, and that helped me deal. I can't describe how cold I was even going uphill. But I would check on things, and I would just check back to that plan of, hey, hold something back for the downhill, you know, drink more, eat more, even though you're on a climb, you know, try to eat a sandwich, try to eat something solid for that descent, because that's when I would really need the energy. And that that helped keep my brain where it needed to be worrying about staying on my bike Mm. and staying in one piece to get to the descent. And part of what I would do, Richard, is I would look at the people at the side of the road. And usually in a race, I would try to ignore the fans and, you know, they weren't necessarily cheering for me because I wasn't a a popular rider with the general fan base, but people were cheering so enthusiastically. Probably it sounds really odd to, to find out what's going through anyone's mind at any point, but certainly a bike racer's mind when they're should be racing for glory i really studied some people Mm -hmm. because they were shivering and some people Mm -hmm. rode their bikes up and they had their little leg warmers they were soaked to the bone like i was they were shivering but they were so passionately excited and i realized it's not this isn't i've done the giro before this isn't tifosi jumping up and down you know and will wear a borat costume in the future Mm -hmm. excited these people are really really thrilled because they're part of it they're shivering even Mm. if they stepped out of the car they're wearing every bit of clothing they possibly can and they're absolutely delighted that we're actually racing by so i I, you know i tried to gauge both how cold they were just standing there to what i should how i should be taking care of myself but also just what an incredibly exceptional experience they were having watching me and the other guys racing so with that i think i kept with my plan of not overdoing it on the climb i picked up my musette bag and mine was pretty light i thought i'm just going to take my plastic rain jacket out of it i have my hat and gloves so throw the rest back to jim the manager but instead of (laughs) my my plastic rain jacket was rolled up frozen of course and i couldn't slide my neoprene gloves through it very easily and by now it's blow this is the last kilometer going to the top it's paved the the road was paved the last couple of kilometers and the first couple of kilometers of standing a little icy because i was blowing around with one hand to get in my jacket i should have just stopped and put it on in 15 or 20 seconds but i had what i believe was 47 seconds or almost a minute on broy kink um but with all that fidgeting around he caught me at the summit and he didn't have a rain jacket of any sort on he had gloves and arm warmers that he must have raised up in and i thought well that's okay we're there's still johan van de Velde's ahead of us i'm not first over the top but i'll now i can do the descent with broy kink you know he's one of the people i'd love to distance today but down to two i'll just i'll gauge the descent off of how broy kink descends so we went over the top together and I followed him, but he was very slow, and I don't know if he was being clever, wanting me, you know, having the same idea and preferring for me to be ahead, but I realized he really wasn't comfortable in the snow, and I grew up in a very snowy climate, and thought, well, you know, I'll take the lead, it's not that much of a disadvantage, and I think I got a gap on him, I never looked back, but I think I got a gap on him, I, I didn't have the impression he was with me after a few kilometers of descending and I wasn't going terribly fast I kept from Max's information I knew there would be a lot of turns the visibility was very low because I've been back to the mountain I know there are points where you can let it you can gain a lot of speed and let it go but there aren't nice predictable straightaways that you can see curves coming it's 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 always left or right turns um, with undulating road pitch on very good traction, two inches of slushy snow on top of mm. a very cohesive mm. um, or adhesive road surface. So I didn't feel I was in danger of sliding out, mm. but I feathered my brakes all down and I pedaled all the way down. I was yeah. like 53, 14, just thinking if I stop my, one, my gears were absolutely frozen. 
other than that one gear, you know, the derailleur may not work if I, if I coast, but also I needed to keep my legs turning because despite my advice to never look at my legs, I looked at my legs and they were bright red mm. with a sheet of ice covering my knee down to my shin. <laughs> and then I thought, okay, well, now I have enough energy because I ate and drank so much. The road's not that mm. slick. If I slide off the road, no one's going to find me. There's not enough light. There's nobody on the descent. There's no lead car. There's no police motorcycle. My car can't follow me because the tires were a little bald. Um, I'm really on my own. And then in the village of Santa Catarina, I believe it's called, um, after, I think, 12 kilometers of descending, the snow turned back to, to rain. The road was two lanes and with, with asphalt a couple of kilometers before the village. The race lead, the race director, Toriani, was <laughs> legend has it, he was he was waiting to see if the race would come because there's no I believe the helicopter that relayed the T V signal is how they did their video, it wasn't flying. But that was also the race radio. So the race didn't really know <laughs> they didn't have their communication going. So the the word is Toriani just went in a cafe and drank coffee and stayed warm and kept his driver at the door <laughs> saying, <laughs> if you see anyone, let me know. <laughs> so from that point, there, there are lead cars, there's my follow car, and then Broy King catches and passes me at seven kilometers to go. And, and the road is very fast. It's on a good day or you know a racer in bad weather, it's 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 fast enough that it's it's one of those situations where I didn't know if it was faster to coast or tuck and pedal, and had that flappy paint jacket on. Kept thinking, should I get rid of it? And I didn't because it was a little bit warm. It was slower, but I thought I might have it. I might have crashed taking off the rain jacket, and I was worried that I wouldn't care because sliding across the ground might be <laughs> warmer than riding how, my bike on it how much did you, but i was yeah. able i was able to use broy kink who i had huge respect for in a situation like that as a rabbit so i kept him in sight he beat me by seven seconds but i was able to you know just as a psychological game i mean it, it's obvious it's a bike race but i was i was slipping into a point where i wasn't sure if i was going to make it to the finish even though it was rain and not snow at this point, it kept me conscientious enough to deal with bike racing at that point instead of just getting off my bike and trying to find somewhere warm. Yeah, I mean, we've seen in, you know, I'm thinking 98, uh, Jan Ulrich probably lost the Tour de France that year because he because he couldn't get a rain cape on on, on descent. Um you know, those moments in, in races are where, literally where the race is won or lost, I guess. Um, how conscious of you of that were you? I mean, you've got these two things going on in your head, I guess. One is preservation, um, suffering, but the other is there is a bike race here that's still to be won. And I, I wonder how you, you know, how, how, how aware you were of these two things and whether you were able to keep in your head all the time the, the importance of the bike race. Yeah, good good question. I, I was because I kept putting it back in the context of just surviving. Just, you know, it, it's, I was counting the kilometers to down. It's down at seven kilometers to go at the speed I was pedaling. I knew I was going about a kilometer a minute. So, you know, the voices were now, come on, Andy, seven minutes, you can do it. It's like, no, I've never, you know, I grew up in North Dakota. It is by far one of the coldest inhabited spots. Well, hmm. people live in colder places, but it, you know, we had seven month winters. Did you draw on that thinking rationally that I, you must have an advantage over someone like Broikink? I did. Because I'd ride my bike to school in the snow because, you know, it wasn't terribly far. You know, it was, it was a few miles, but it was warmer than waiting for a bus and not moving at all. But I knew from that that my core temperature was lower than it's ever been. The, the dangers, you know, growing up in a very cold climate was more frostbite. You know, I can't feel my fingers. 
you know, I put them in my mouth. Oh, I can't feel that. Okay, I'm in trouble. You know, my digits are in trouble or my nose and ears would peel every winter because I went out, did something outside too long and I'd, I'd frost bite that skin. But I knew that my core temperature was low enough that wasn't thinking well. Um, and I really needed to get somewhere warm very soon. But I also realized, hey, a hot tub is, is the solution. Get to the hotel and hope to God it's past the finish line and not before the finish line. Because thinking of only a hot bathtub, I might have stopped if I would have seen my mm. uh, my hotel along the way. I hope I wouldn't have. Mentre Andy Amstin ha già rivestito la maglia rosa, Andrew Amstin è la nuova maglia rosa, eccolo qua nella zona riservata alla premiazione accanto a lui. I mean that that stage and those images, I suppose, really elevate you're winning that Giro don't they? they they sort of raise it above I mean it's all, winning a Grand Tour is always a, a, a pretty exceptional thing but there's, there's something about that those images in particular and that story the, the mythology around that day that that sort of you know raises that, that Giro above a lot of other Grand Tours it does for me and talking to <clears throat> other riders who were there that day it's a shared experience that you know some people wish the race would have been cancelled but talking to racers that just you know weren't in the top 10 but just needed to survive the day they're they're very proud of it Mm. and perhaps more importantly i mean it's a real privilege being an athlete and you know winning a grand tour is an enormous privilege that i've had but talking to the people that live there that (laughs) shepherds or you know their families are mountain people they're still so proud of that day and the days in the 60s and, you know, all the times that the race came through. But certainly that day, because, you know, maybe it could have been canceled with the bad weather. They're proud that their way of life was, you know, they go through that all the time because it, it's hard weather up there. The fact that the racers went ahead and did the race is something that is very important to the the people that live up there. And they're they're very appreciative, not of me or Broykink who won the stage, but they're very appreciative of everyone who who did the race. So I think for that reason, for, for me, it everyone who finished that day or participated in that day really added something, not added because it was already on 80 or 70 years of Chiro history. It really boosted all the previous hardships that racers have gone through. Um, it, it sort of boosted the lore of, of bike racing for the fans. The Cycling Podcast at Our Giro d'Italia is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much to Science and Sport for their support of the Cycling Podcast. You can get 25% off by using the code SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com. That's SISCP25 at scienceandsport.com. Science and Sport's nutrition would have come in very handy, I imagine, in 1988 on the Gavia stage. And it's amazing to hear... Andy Hampson relive that day in particular, you know, which was such an important day in putting together uh, the performances to win the 1988 Giro, and it's it's almost impossible to reconcile the the, the very fresh faced and 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 articulate and polite and and friendly uh, man that Andy Hampson is with uh, a rider who on that day had to be as tough as nails and to endure really awful conditions wearing clothing that is certainly not as advanced as clothing is today to withstand you know that sort of cold and and just the 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 danger as well i mean he talked about the the unpaved road you know the the snow the the ice the 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 lack of visibility um and we've seen lots of stages with the extreme weather protocol you know in in more recent years 
being stopped or you know neutralized in in conditions not not nearly as bad as that let's face it um and it's it's amazing that the stage went ahead uh, but it did and it was obviously uh, hugely important in in his giro victory well you mentioned the clothing rich and there's some very famous pictures from that day but by far my favorite picture or pictures are the ones of Gianni Savio in what can only be described as well it looks like a sort of alpaca wool technicolor knee-length cardigan sort of shivering like a granny on the summit and um, I think Janney had a full head of, of, of completely perfectly brown hair um, until that day and then he came down from the Gavia and um, you know it was lovely and pearly white and it has been ever since are you saying that it's snow it's snow on his hair Yes. Yeah. He had the nice kind of warming a uh, bit of fur on his on his top lip as well. Um, so he would have been reasonably protected from the conditions. But you know, it, it's a stage that is famous for those those pictures, those images, and for Andy Hampson in particular. And yet he wasn't the first over the top of the Gavia, and he wasn't the win, winner of the stage. Those are kind of quirks of that day, aren't they? No, Johan van der Velde, a Dutchman, was first to the top and had to stop and was so cold and um, you know, suffered ter- Well, they all suffered terribly on the descent. It was just who was able to keep going um, the, the most. And uh, Eric Breukink won the stage and Hampston came into Bormio seven seconds later. But when you look at the results, Pedro Delgado was in 10th place at seven minutes and eight seconds. And it was a real, you know, it was a, it was a day that, as we said yesterday in setting up this episode, it does deserve the, um, the, the, the epic tag, really. And uh, probably something that Daniel talks about, the, the mystique is preserved by the fact that we can't watch it, really. There's nothing, there's no footage of the, the, the condition. So we kind of, it, it all builds in everybody's imagination just from the photographs which are obviously is clearly extremely cold and all the stories of you know raiding yeah. the ski shops to get the get the jackets and stopping in cafes to warm up and and uh, you know the the debates on the road about whether to keep going or not and uh, just the sort of the the you know the fact that the the race organizers pretty much uh, blew the whistle sent them all off out there and you know see what happens i mean it's a bit again, like on Henri de grange in yeah. 1910 when when they sent them into the pyrenees for the first time but yeah i mean the the pictures though you know of the the snow um you, you know beginning to to sit on riders gloves and 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 so on it's, it's almost like a a 1930s assault on Everest, isn't it? More more than a bike race. You mentioned the Twitter storm napalm uh, that would have happened if if the Giro was now announced or the Giro route was unveiled six weeks before the start of the Giro. I mean, imagine what it would have been like um, had a present day Giro boss sent sent the riders down the Gavia um, in conditions like that. Well, the extreme weather pr- protocol would have would have done for it, and uh, probably rightly so. To be honest, I mean, you know, there is there is a line, and that stage probably. I mean, you're both Richard says smiling at the. No, no. I mean, it, I'm just. It, um, you couldn't. No, you no. Can't I'm, really I'm just imagining. It. I'm imagining the tweets. It would have been a a virtue signaller's paradise, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, uh, calling foul, calling foul on that. But that is one of the ironies. We now. You know, Absolutely. we now sort of fetishize it in a way, and we we celebrate it for, um, you know, w- cycling and, and grand tour riding is an extreme sport, and this was, this was grand tour cycling in extremis, and and it's as extreme as it gets, and so we celebrate it. But you're right, it was dangerous, and and something dreadful might have happened, and you know, riders could have had very serious uh, health problems as a result, or 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 accidents. So. Um, yeah, it was it was crazy. It was foolhardy. Even in the absence of something terrible having happened, um, I did notice, you know, just reading the newspaper reports from the time that it was referred to as a tragedy. Even then, um, you know, the riders, um, I think they all got safely to Bormio, but the, the press um, weren't too enamoured with Vincenzo Torriani, the race director, for for sending them down the Gavia. Um, and on the other hand, the riders, I think some of the riders, knew that they'd been through something that was going to be talked about for years to come. In fact, uh, Jean-Francois Bernard, the French rider, who was one of the favourites still at that point, I think, in the race, he was still in contention. Um, he had to he aban- won the next day, actually. He Bernard. did, yeah. And he had to abandon a, a few days later. And he said, um, in 50 years' time, our children and grandchildren will still be talking about that 
day on the Gavia and he was, you know, right. I mean, we're not quite there yet, 50 years. But um, what what always intrigues me about the 1988 Giro is that no one ever talks about the, the stage two days later, which was from Merano to Innsbruck. And Jean-Francois Bernard was again a protagonist. And that day the race was going over the Timmelsjoch or the Passo del del Rombo, which is a, a pass that goes um, from Italy into Austria. And it's known as the secret passageway because it allows you to avoid, circumvent the Brenner Pass, which um, is, is notorious for traffic. And it's a beautiful climb, 2,400 and something metres. Only time the Giro has ever been over it, 1980. But um, sort of traumatised, shell-shocked by what happened on the Gavia, the riders had sort of got together and said, um, well, they'd, they'd seen the weather forecast, pretty grim weather forecast, and they thought it was going to snow again. And they said, right, first sign of snow, we're all getting off our bikes. So off they went um, up the um, Paso del Rombo, and about halfway up, there, w- there was a sort of sleety snow. Um, there was a, they, they got off their bikes, and there was a bit of a conflab. Um, is it really is this snow does this justify us getting off and they decided on the whole that it did um, but not all of the bunch riders bunch of snowflakes eh yes very snowflakes. much so but not all of the riders the Swiss rider Daniel Giesiger, um he he bolted off down the road he didn't adhere to the the sort of um, the moratorium and um, and then the, the riders continued and stopped again when the snow or the sleet got slightly worse and um, started talking about stopping the stage. And again, there were a few mutineers. Um, now Jean-Francois Bernard sort of set up a picket line um, in front of the peloton to stop anyone passing. He sort of planted his bike and challenged anyone, sort of uh, a kind of a, a Bernardino-esque stance in the middle of the road. And um, and then the director sportif started rebelling against the riders, um, telling the riders that they were a disgrace. They were snowflakes for not carrying on. And, um, and, and then they set off again, and then there was a third stoppage in a tunnel, and they finally decided that everyone was going to go to the top and over the top, down the other side in the team cars, and they were going to carry on the race, much like San Remo in 2013, um, from the bottom of the descent into Innsbruck. But again, there were a few who broke rank. The Panasonic team, um, they... They ignored the order and they went off down the road and the other riders, as pretty much as they were getting into their team cars, they had to abort that, abandon um, the mutiny and they had to race. And there was a furious pursuit then down the, the, the other side of the Timmelsjoch and into Innsbruck and um, Jean-Francois Bernard was seen sort of with a clench waving a clenched fist at Vincenzo Torriani later and um, yeah it was all it was all pretty um, shambolic and some cracking quotes after the stage um, Fred De Bruyne who was one of the Panasonic DS's or team managers he said about the riders wanting to stop. They're pathetic. If, if we had to stop racing because of rain um, in Belgium, cycling would be abolished. And Gino Bartoli, um, who was doing one of his last Giri as a pundit, said, now they're stopping for two drops of rain. In my day, we didn't even get off our bikes if a war broke out. One of the... Uh, there were only two, only two abandons on that stage to Innsbruck. One of them was our friend Cesare Cipollini, older brother of Mario wow. Cipollini. And just going back to the stage over the Gavia, uh, 10 abandons that day and one non-starter. I mean, that's not a bad... Uh, I know they relaxed the time cut, didn't they? But um, only, only 10 people uh, didn't, didn't make it um, all the way on their bikes. So, I mean, not... not a, not as big a toll as there was probably some rule breaking going on. Oh, I imagine bet there's some, some cracking stories that we've never heard from that day. I yeah, bet a few with people, no TV cameras. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. For, Forty riders who did the Gavia in the car. Yeah, I, I don't know about you, but I I really enjoyed um, listening to Andy Hampston. I, I I've interviewed him a few times over the years for well, first for selling the Badger, my book about eighty six tour, and I've always found him very generous and interesting to speak to he does spend quite a lot of the year in italy now um and in colorado the rest of the year and you know there's a, so, i mean we've we've heard from him on the 85 and 88 giros but there's there's such an interesting story he has to tell apart from his own successes he was a teammate of greg lamond bernardino lance armstrong and miguel injuring he spent a year at benesto towards the end of his career so you know he's ridden with some of the greats and uh and the controversial Lance Armstrong and had some 
amazing successes himself. And that Giro in '88 really puts him uh, in in, a, in his own category. He's the only American winner of the Giro d'Italia. Uh, so we'll revisit the Andy Hampson story, I think, in the company of Andy Hampson at some point in the future. We should wrap things up, though. Before we do, just a corrections corner from something I said earlier. I joked that if Daniel did have a wine podcast, he'd do a long, uh, you know, rambling detour to talk about the history of uh, you know, the 1963 tour of the Mediterranean. Well, the tour of the Mediterranean <laughs> didn't actually start until 1974. Wow. It was founded, of course, by, <laughs> by Lucien Imar, oh, which, which just makes it even more likely that Daniel would dig up some kind uh. of story about a precursor to <laughs> oh, the yeah. official event. Lucy and Imar, right. of course. Lucy and Imar didn't get a mention yesterday when we were talking about great descenders, one of the greatest descenders of all time by most accounts. Oh, come on. Right. That's enough corrections for one episode. And um, what's coming up tomorrow, Daniel? Um, good question. Good question. Oh, we're going to Bergamo, aren't we? We're going to go to Bergamo. And because we, well, we won't be staying in Bergamo, we'll be heading through the suburbs or we're fighting through the suburbs of Milan uh, on the awful... Uh, ring road that goes around the north of Milan and we'll be going towards a place called Magenta which is where or very close to there is where where Luca Guercilena who is now the team manager team principal the, the head honcho at Trek Segafredo was born and um, yeah we're going to be hearing my conversation a long conversation I had with Luca Guercilena where he comes from how he got into cycling um, highs and lows in his managerial career well I can guess what that includes and well, um, I, I coming up also tomorrow right. as, as, we, uh, as we skirt Bergamo um, Stacey Snyder's second batch of mugs will go on sale uh, they're raising money for the Scuola Ciclismo Ceni a cycling school near to Bergamo the first batch sold out in 11 minutes so act quickly go to the episode notes if you want details about how to try and buy one of Stacey's cycling podcast mugs or cappuccino sets and I'll be cooking polenta with Italian sausage ragu delicious great well lots to look forward to Um, in the meantime thank you very much Daniel thank you thank you Lionel and we're going to say some thanks to friends of the podcast aren't we before we before we go so thank you very much for supporting the podcast to Josh Powell, Matt Evans, Stan McDonald, Matt Lehman and Matthew Franklin. I've got all the Matts and Matthews this evening. And thanks from me to Giles Healy, Matthew Eig, Scott Fouillance, Jean-Sylvain Gauthier and John Floyd. And from me, thank you to Chris Wheatley, Andrew Gladwin, James Forrest, Stephen Dodson and John Yates. Ora se lo mangiano le femmine